Okay, so it's uh, it's a minute past four here where I am. Um, different hour for many folks out there. I see that we are up to about uh, almost 20 attendees, so we'll get started. Um, welcome to the uh, live Q&A session for uh, session number nine, it might be in the population genetics uh, three presentations. Uh, my name is Anthony and uh, I'll be moderating this, this Q&A session. Um, so we have online um, three of our panelists uh, today, and they include uh, Rami Patiri Apuli, Mitra Manon, and Tal Shalav. Sorry if I butchered any of those names. Um, so what we're going to be doing here right now is going to be entertaining questions for folks that have uh, viewed the three presentations from our three panelists. There's a Q&A box. Um, so I would ask that you click on the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen there and start typing your questions in. Um, it's gonna take a little bit of time to, to get some questions up on there. So maybe what we'll do is um, there's a few questions that were posted on the chat side of things in Feedloop. Um, so maybe we can start by, by answering one of those. So Tal, maybe um, if you could read out one of the questions that you have over there that you'd like to, to give an answer to. Yeah, I think Sally just asked it again in the in the Q and A. So. Um, oh, okay. Is that the same question? Yeah. 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 So okay. So I got it right here. So from Sally, um, going up to Tal, what method did you use to estimate the remarkably low NE of one eighty eight? Yeah. So thanks, Sally. Um, so basically, uh, the the method that we used was uh, the method of. Um, the linkage disequilibrium method as implemented in an E estimator. And the approach that we took to try to reduce linkage disequilibrium was to create a pseudo genetic map for CEDAR and then um, just select SNPs that were as far apart as possible on each linkage group in order to, uh, in order to run the uh, estimating software. Sorry. Um, and, and, uh, sorry, I got distracted here. Someone's trying to call me. Um, uh, yeah, so we just tried to reduce linkage as much as possible and, uh, and then estimate and it came out to a very low estimate. Uh, the confidence interval for that is quite a bit higher. So I, I have more confidence in the, uh, confidence interval, which is somewhere from between a hundred to a thousand, but it's still very, uh, very low number for the overall population. Yeah. Okay, good, thanks, Tal. So I've got another question here that just came up um, for Mitra. Um, first of all, nice and courageous work. Um, I was surprised by the small number of 26 transcripts indicative of phenotypic plasticity. I was expecting many more. Am I not understanding well the criteria used for declaring a transcript indicative or not of phenotypic plasticity? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I, I, I sort of skipped over a couple of the details there, I guess. So um, for the 26 transcripts, they have to have a QST higher than SSD in each of the gardens. And so the way I did that was for each transcript, I generated a parametric bootstrap distribution of the QST and compared that with the SSD, um, the 95th quantile of the SSD. So because our sample size was small, even though the point estimate for QST for several of the transcripts was quite high, when you look at the confidence interval in several of the cases, it overlapped with that of the FSD. And so I think that is one of the reasons why we ended up with so few transcripts out of the total of 27,000. But then the other thing is um, I also compared, I also did like a t-test to look at if the distribution, if the parametric distribution of QST was significantly different between the two gardens to call it as phenotypic plasticity. So it's like a two-step process, QFC, FSD, and then the TST test, T test. Okay, thanks Mitra. And uh, just by the way, that was a question from Jean Bousquet. Um, nice to see you there, Jean. I've got a, another question here from Brian, Brian Barber. So this is going out to Tal again. Um, in your talk, you indicated as climate became drier and hotter, red cedar's range will expand. Um, Brian is wondering if you didn't mean wetter, 
with projected expansion, or sorry, with projected expansion of interior temperate rainforest, species is susceptible to drought as recently observed with dieback on drier areas on the Pacific coast. Yeah, thank you, Brian. I think I had a slip of a tongue there. I, I mean, as, as um, based on the climate projection models that we have, as climate change progresses, we expect to see expansion of western red cedar. But yeah, no, I know that, yeah, they do uh, do worse as it gets very, very dry, but I guess we're not expecting that here in British Columbia, uh, per se. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So Sally's got a question for, for Rami. Very interesting work on genetic load. Um, we did a similar study on deleterious alleles within a spruce hybrid zone in Canada. What approach did you use to identify deleterious alleles and what are the limitations or advantages of that approach? Uh, we used um, quite simple heuristic methods where we first um, uh, filtered out the um, um, low psi per like p-value and then in those uh, low psi uh, we um, only use the ones uh, where the the allele like one of the alleles uh, was not in the multiple species alignment that uh, is uh, used for the locus, um, uh, finding the loci. So it is kind of, um, it's not a very uh, fancy way of doing it, but from, uh, from my experience in uh, Populus Trichocarpa, where I kind of did this same thing as well, it seems that there, it, that we, at least get uh, a nice amount of deleterious uh, alleles. I mean, we may, may be losing some of the, um, we may be losing some uh, deleterious uh, alleles that of course are present in other species as well, but at least we can uh, kind of uh, get a, quite clean and somewhat certain set of deleterious alleles. Okay, great, thanks. There's a, a few more for you. Um, no, actually the next, I think we've already answered that one. Yes, that's right. Okay, so the next one is for, for Mitra, um, coming from Antonio uh, Castilla. Why did you use only the conditional adaptive set of transcripts? Why don't you use transcripts indicating FST greater than QST in both trials? I think I'm missing something here. Yeah, um, Antonia, thanks for the question. Yeah, it is, there is really no reason as such as to why we can't use just the transcripts with FST greater than QST, but I think I just wanted here specifically to focus on um, sort of the G by E aspect, and that's why I was focusing mainly on only the conditionally adaptive set of transcripts, because if I just look at, I mean, I'm not saying that the other side is not um, useful or interesting, it's useful, but just for this purpose, I was only looking at the G by E aspect, that's it. Okay, thank you. So uh, maybe a follow-up question for you, Mitra, uh, from Natalie Isabel. For how long have you grown the seedlings? Have you sampled one or many time points? And if so, when? Um, yeah, Natalie. So uh, these were grown for about two or three years, the seedlings, and uh, unfortunately the sampling was done just at one time point. It was just done in the fall, and um, um, some of the trees during that time were, there, I mean, there were differences in the developmental stage. Some were progressing towards bud set, but some had not, especially uh, in the high elevation garden. So it was just one time point. Thanks. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, so going on to Tal now, um, question from uh, Zhang Liang. If most red cedars genes experience purifying selection based off our 
um, are your NS analysis. Did you have a small list of any genes that might be classified as being positively selected? Okay, so I'm not sure if I completely understand. I think, uh, so most of the genes that we looked at, um, we found are being maintained under balancing selection. Um, so very weak purifying selection, if any purifying selection that we can observe. Um, so therefore, uh, as for genes that would be under positive selection, uh, there is maybe a small list that are putatively under positive selection, but it is quite small. Yeah, we see mostly that it's uh, a, lo a lot of the, the selection that is there is, is balancing selection that is maintaining this heterozygous state. So uh, I, I'm assuming that you mean uh, in the selfing um, experiment that we did. Uh, so there is a small list, yes, I guess, of, of positively selected or putatively positively selected genes. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, going to Rami now, um, question from Eddie Lauer. First comment, he's saying, thanks for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, there is also a high genetic load in my study species Pinus tidae. However, I find that the linkage phase between make markers and deleterious alleles is not stable. The direction and magnitude of average effects often change between full sib families. Is it possible to account for changes in linkage phase with these species wide diversity summaries? Uh, I feel like I, I have not uh, done the determination of, uh, of deleterious alleles and loci in the same way so i i don't think i can answer that in a, uh, in a uh, acceptable manner okay um So I've got a question here uh, from Natalie Isabel it says, following your answer, what would you recommend to do? So I'm assuming that was your answer to, was it a question to Tal? Let me go back here uh, for Mitra, I guess. So Mitra, the, I think it was the question for how long have you grown the seedlings? Have you sampled one or many time points and when? And then based on that answer, what would you recommend to do? Um, not exactly sure if I follow, but I guess maybe one concern um, there, um, I guess one concern there would be that um, since these seedlings are so young, some of the aspects that you're capturing is just a uh, maternal effect. And so I guess sampling them at um, another time point would be useful. But um, I guess another thing that came up was during the time that we sampled the seedlings, that was the year that they experienced really severe drought and also um, they experienced a lot of uh, precipitation as snow. And some of the patterns that we note, especially in the co-expression network, I think might be driven by that. And so, um, yeah, something at a time, maybe, which is more reflective of what these species actually experience in their range would uh, be nice to sort of follow up if that architecture still matches or not. But I'm not sure if I completely answered your question there. Okay. Well, thanks, Mitra. That, that brings us to the end of our time here. It's a quarter after. Um, so there was 56 attendees, so that's great. There was good turnout, good, good questions, good answers. I just want to point out that uh, if anybody wants to follow discu the discussion or um, you know ask more questions and get answers to to questions, you know the fun there is functionality in Feed Loop. You, you can go back to the session um, presentation in Feed Loop and put some questions in the chat there. And and if the uh, panelists have time, they they can answer there. And there's also the uh, functionality of being able to do networking in feed loop if, if you guys want to connect with the panelists. So great. Thank you for all the questions and uh, great presentations and uh, enjoy the rest of the, the event. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.